Hey, hello everyone. It's uh, Brian Nikas here from Colonial Purchasing and Making Vinyl. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here for our series four of the MediaTek Business Forum. Uh, today we're going to be talking about these shiny things. I don't know, I don't know if you can see them so well. They, they, for those that you don't know, they're called compact discs. And uh, just kidding, honestly speaking. Uh, but honestly, it's a it's an interesting time uh, for us now to kind of reconsider the CD um, with the extended uh, lead times in vinyl, manufacturing shortages. Many artists are now looking at alternative sources, and one of those sources is the CD. Um, today's webinar is going to talk about those particular benefits and opportunities that are immediate, immediately available compared to vinyl. And uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers today. Uh, we have Connie Como, the COO of the ADS Group. Uh, we have Sven Deutschmann, the CEO of Sonopraus Germany. Uh, Christa, Christoph Diekmann, the Managing Director of Ad Value Consulting. And at the end of today's session, we have a very special presentation about vinyl postcards, um, something very new, something very unique, and uh, I hope you guys all can stick around till the end. So um, I guess at this point, um, maybe what we could do is we can invite Sven up first so that he can uh, give us a bit of a market update. I know Sven has been working on this presentation and we're very interested to learn more about what's happening in the world of CD. So Sven, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, uh, Brian. Very good meeting everyone. And uh, let's see, video is starting. Video is starting. Hello, everyone, and thanks again, Brian, for this. Uh, so I haven't prepared any PowerPoint presentation because I think uh, the one-on-one -on -one talks and talking to each other is um, the better thing and giving you some insights. Brian, is it meant to be um, introducing Sonopress for two minutes and then hand over to the others, or do I step directly in? in uh, market analysis or how, how do you oh to... let's let's go ahead and uh you go ahead and introduce sonopress and then jump right into the market analysts uh, okay uh, assumption and then we'll go from there okay very good very good understand very good so so about sonopress not not too much to uh, say here this is a company founded in 58 so in the last century and uh, was with a lot of final business for decades and um we are now yeah, more than 60 years in the business and concentrating on CD and optical media for years in the last years. Uh, besides Sonopress, we also run Topak as a printing arm within the same Sonopress group. And um, Topak is really busy with printing vinyl sleeves. So we have seen, especially this year, a tremendous growth rate in vinyl sleeves for the market. And this was a great development uh, in comparison to the last years where vinyl was growing constantly but now this year is really a breakthrough with tremendous numbers volumes at sonopress same story here uh, located with our main hub for production in uh, germany and we are shipping disc not only in europe but also from here to uh, the regions uh, including north america asia australia and um, we are, as, as most of you might know, not only active in the audio business, but also in uh, video and video games. And uh, this is a threefold approach to the markets. And in the optical media, it's not only CD, but it's in, in the same manner also DVD business, Blu-ray business, and especially UHD, which is the disc including three layers up to 100 gigabyte storage capacity. When we look at the market, and to keep it directly to the point, it was a very interesting, so to say, challenging year with a lot of aspects. And um, everybody is concentrating first on the question of what are the value, uh, volumes developing like. And um, so to say, the end is not over yet, but what we see is that the volumes are very good and this is not only to us, but to a lot of market players. And what we see is, especially looking at the music market, that we see a lot of new releases. So due to the pandemic restrictions in the last 18 months in lots of regions, artists 
could not perform any live concerts. And uh, on the other hand, they have been active, creative as never before. And uh, we, we see a lot of new releases coming up this uh, fall. And it's like in a weekly pattern, we see the Ed Sheerans, the Rod Stewart's, the Adele's, the Lady Gaga's, the Billie Eilish, all these new releases are either already released or coming up in the next days or weeks. And this is huge volumes to the market. It's not only a surprise that the volumes are in comparison to two years ago, three years ago on each title, um, even bigger than expected, but it's also a surprise that there's so much trust and confidence in the physical media. And this is not a one-time effect. This is like an effect that we see, which is continued through all the different uh, labels, major labels, artists, and activities in all of the regions. And this is really um, a very positive signal to the industry. Uh, having said this, the peak season this year, to our observation, all across the industry has started much earlier. Instead of having this like, uh, normally it's like a September, October effect, and then everything has to be ready for Black Friday and for, for the uh, retail, um, Christmas season to be started at the end of uh, November. This year, everything seems to be much earlier. So we started like end of July, the peak season already started, and then like 24 seven production all through the weeks and weekends. And uh, this was earlier. What was this effect based upon? First of all, maybe also due that the vinyl production has started earlier with all the huge order entries all across the titles. Vinyl was leading the past that also CD production in some of the cases has been started earlier. This is number one. Number two is what we've seen is the expected shortage of a lot of uh, market players and labels uh, that it might be difficult to get the reorders in time into the markets, into the retail. The initial orders have been much bigger than in uh, I would say orders like two years ago. So we see like there's a French artist coming up um, also in the next uh, weeks uh, for release. And the volume is like double as high as the last albums a couple of years ago. What is driving this? This is the order pattern that in most of the initial um, order volumes now, the reorders are included already. And this led to a peak, which was really huge in the months of August, September for production. And now we are just um, getting ready for, for getting everything to retail. So this was number one. And you might ask like, why is everybody expecting this shortage? Is it due to capacity, replication, logistic packaging uh, capacities? And um, in hindsight, it has begun much earlier. It was probably after Q1 when the industry and all market players were aware that there could be like raw material shortages all across. And you may have heard of uh, polycarbonate. This was the first wave flooding the whole market about is there enough polycarbonate? And like never before, all of the market players for optical uh, media application have been faced with like a shortage of polycarbonate. And this was, story why this all occurred was going back to like there was a shortage hurricane affected um, lockdowns of the manufacturing sites for polycarbonate much earlier going back to september 2019 but it all got into the years of 2020 and then there was another winter storm a blizzard in the us with, with closures of, of certain um, uh, sites and Brian is an expert in telling all the story about the polycarbonate um, effects uh, which occurred for the industry. But then there was a shortage and nobody could believe uh, how the whole industry tried to get hold of polycarbonate. It was like polycarbonate from Europe was shipped across the ocean into the Asian region and vice versa. So it was like everybody was trying to get hold of polycarbonate and the prices for polycarbonate, unbelievable, went up 10%, another 20%, another 30%, another 20%. In the end, what we see now is comparison to the starting price this year, the material 
has doubled in price per pound, per kilogram, whatever you, you want to reflect it upon. And when everybody thought like, okay, the supply situation with polycarbonate turns out to be a little bit more safe in comparison to the beginning of Q1, Q2, the next wave was affecting jewel cases. And then everybody thought like, wow, what is happening to jewel cases? Shortage, price increase all across. And the bigger problem was the availability. Is the material, is the product there? This was a much bigger question than anything else. This was driving the whole industry. And then everybody thought like the solution is, instead of going to jewel cases, let's try carton-based products, which is also the more environmental, environmental oriented packaging with sustainability. So let's go for board and paper. But now what we have seen in the last eight weeks, paper and board, same story. Paper board, it's a shortage unbelievable to everybody globally and this is affecting also the vinyl sleeves and printing the availability of the board material of paper but also everything for cd production and all the other optical media instead of having normally like a supply situation that you can get board and paper within two weeks three weeks latest and you get everything in house now we are told the lead time increases up to six months and longer and there's like an allocation principle that you don't get what you want. So paper, there's a shortage, board, carton-based, everything. And this does not end. And I could continue here forever with, with uh, naming all of the uh, components which are, which are necessary to produce a CD. It's unbelievable. It's affecting lacquers, bonding lacquers. It's affecting cellophane. It's affecting the shrinking foil. And there's a shortage all across. You can name it, all of the components are under pressure. And you need a lot of logistic forecast intelligence to be put into these products. And everybody, I think, can confirm this, that there is a planning needed, which foresees like what is happening in the next six months, eight months, 10 months, uh, to get everything into the sites for being prepared for the production. So this was a lot of challenges and once a CD is manufactured, it doesn't end at the manufactured disk. It continues in the supply chain. So what we have seen with a quick look in the European landscape, it was, of course, also due to the pandemic restrictions. Can we get the trucks from one country to the other country? What is happening at borders? Borders were brought up again with lockdowns in the various countries. Brexit was happening also. And passant, so there was a Brexit was getting uh, things into the UK was more challenge than ever before. And this all was overlaying the whole situation of logistics. If you look it up, there's a shortage in respect of transport. The truck drivers, all across Europe, we are short of truck drivers. Second, fuelage. There was a fuel in the UK for certain weeks. There was no fuel available and trucks were getting into UK, but not coming back and other stories. So it was crazy. Then if you look to other goods and the whole supply chain, which we were expecting in uh, Germany to arrive from, let's say, Taiwan, from Far East, from US and vice versa, the sea container ships were on the ocean with the sea containers. But the harbors were blocked could be a COVID-19 uh, case or other reasons, but the harbor was just blocked. And so the containers were still waiting to be released and getting into the country. The containers, again, were missing for the trucks on other transport links. So the whole thing, and uh, I would say it's not over yet, it might even increase from the challenging uh, atmosphere and this whole thing. So this is not over. and We have to uh, continue to be prepared and think of a lot of things in the supply chain. And this is so important because a physical media like a CD is, is embedded into the whole um, area of uh, challenges in the logistical chains and the retail. And coming back to the point as such, because we are talking, what is the value of the physical media? And there is a lot of trust confidence by the labels, by the artists, and they really want to publish something. We see the same driver for vinyl for a long time, and we now can confirm this is the same case for CD. CD is a very valuable item. It's a, it's an identity. 
it's not only a product, it's an identity, it's something to stay for a very long period. And uh, there is a value that's really been seen not by the involved players, but also by the consumers. We see it that a lot of pre-ordering was possible for certain uh, CDs, and some of these titles are already sold out. So there's really very positive acceptance of these physical products, which is very positive, and, and this is where the industry is preparing for. And let me share some, some uh, conclusive uh, thoughts of this. Just um, today, I was um, in, uh, looking up for the session that Brian, thankfully, has uh, prepared for all of us uh, to exchange our thoughts. I was putting uh, the famous Google search on the site, and I was Googling up for some of the main topics which uh, all of us drive. And uh, one question I just put on, just some keywords was, and you can do the same, I put on, and I only wanted to see what is, what is uh, Google showing up for the last seven days, and it's like, Music, business, physical media. And one of the highlighted answers was coming up. It's a post which is five days old. And it was a question put on um, the platform uh, Reddit. And uh, the question was, why is the so-called vinyl on the rise by physical media for the movies is considered as dying? Blu-rays are far superior to streaming in terms of quality whilst vinyl is inferior to both CD and stream music. And the answer, I think, is so positive and uh, gives us a lot of hint why physical media has value. And um, this goes in the direction, and I think what is true for vinyl is also true for CD, because both is a physical product. Um, a big plus of the vinyl is that it has big album covers. So you really have a product which can be used for decoration, but it surely is also, to add this from my opinion, is this is a physical product which really gives a product in your environment. It's a statement. It's not only music which can be listened to, but it's a statement that you own it. Second was here, using a record player makes the entire thing more involved and you experience the music with all your attention. Next sentence as the answer is, digital is just used as background noise. Buying vinyl, and I would add in bracket CD, also supports the artist more than streaming. So true, we all know that streaming is not paying to the artist um, good money in the end. A physical product contributes definitely more. Another factor, and this is um, what most haven't had in mind for a long time is the album. In streaming, it's one song, one song, one song. With physical media, it's an album. And many musicians make albums intended to be listened all the way through in the right order. And this is not done by many in streaming. So this, I think, is very um, positive news to everybody who is involved in physical media. And I would like to share another thought. And I googled another three words in it. and. Um, it was a little bit more provocative. And I said, like, CD, business, dying. And I thought, do I put the question mark behind it or just the three words? I just picked the three words. And um, again, this is an article just a couple of days old. It's from November 4th, 2021. So just a couple of days old. And what it showed up is a brilliant article. And I just can recommend it to everybody in this call. It's... Um, a couple of pages and with the headline how the decline of compact disc is killing music and um, it's a very very positive article uh, it's it's like a, a advocate for the physical media especially here for the compact disc with all of the advantages i don't want to read you through but it's so good to read it uh, for many years it was us from the optical media industry and all players who are doing uh, like replications like we do, um, we're looking for the right argumentation. Uh, what is an advantage of the CD as a physical media against streaming, against uh, digital downloads? And we were looking for the arguments. What we now see is that others jump on this train. It's artists, it's enthusiasts and all across, and they really fight for keeping this physical media alive. And uh, on... Um, 
want to share with you because I have yellow highlighted this. One of the aspects uh, this article is is so truly um, talking about is yes, if this is digital services and your music is in a cloud, how to ensure that this music is still available in five years, ten years, fifteen years? Because we are all depending that those services are around in twenty years. And what if the cloud service disappears overnight? What then happens to all of your music? And um, a good another sentence in here is we can't rely on hard drives and the ubiquitous cloud storage to protect our music and culture for years or decades to come. It may exist somewhere in the digital vault of some record company, but as far as the public is concerned, it is gone. And I strongly confirm physical media is for a long term the argument of us being the manufacturers, replicators, and offering these services to the music artists and labels. But now, again, repeating myself, others jump on the train. And this is a good sign that the value of physical media has really been seen. And the success story of the last weeks of tremendous volumes, replication volumes, speaks its own language. And it's a very good sign for the industry. So, Brian, if this is for this opening statement from my side, and you're happy with the timing. I'm not so sure if it was too short, too long. Give me I think it was time. absolutely perfect. I, I really am happy that you hit on all of the highlights and gave such a wonderful analysis of what's happening within the industry, and uh, also to understand better what's happening within Europe. And, and of course, the, you know, people say to me all of the time, you know, Brian, why are you still working in the physical media business? It should be dead by now. You know, look, vinyl has surpassed uh, the sales of CDs. Uh, you know, this is going to be the next trend. And I'm like, look, I've been in this business a lot longer than many other people have been. And I see it continuing. And as you mentioned, you know, I am an expert in polycarbonate and I still see that we buy a tremendous amount of polycarbonate. So that doesn't mean that CD is dead just yet. It just means that, as you said, there is a lot of different interesting ways that we can consume it. There's a lot of ways that we can protect our music. And there are other opportunities that are available by using a physical medium. So uh, I really appreciate what you said, and I look forward to having more discussion with you uh, along with the others. And I'd like to take this opportunity to bring up our next speaker, who's very much, we'll say, experienced in the advanced formats, being pure audio, Blu-ray audio, 4K UHD audio. Uh, this is Christoph Diekman uh, with uh, Value Add Consulting. Christoph, if you want to go ahead and uh, give us a little bit about your background and also tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening within this immersive space, um, I turn over the floor to you at this moment. Thanks a lot, Brian, for inviting me and having me here. Um, yeah, at Value Consulting, I started in the 2015 after working for more than 20 years for Sony DADC. So I'm coming out of the replication business of optical media. And um, for me, physical media and products that you can touch are quite uh, important. So I'm not a big fan of digital media. And so I love to have product, to own product. And um, I see over the past years, a lot of developments now where we have good chances and where artists and labels have good chances to earn money and to, to increase their revenue through new formats which are coming up. So I would like to share a little presentation and maybe we can discuss this later on in terms of what's happening with um, out of the studios because we see so far um, um, uh, production companies doing high-res uh, recordings and 24 bits, 96 kilohertz, but we rarely see them in the marketplace. So we have some uh, high-res portals maybe for streaming, but on physical media, there is the Blu-ray disc, which is uh, quite interesting to support and, and to work with. And now even more with immersive audio, and I'm, I'm uh, sure everyone has uh, seen the Dolby Atmos announcements from Apple, um, everyone is quite crazy about Dolby Atmos and what this could mean 
I will come to that in a couple of minutes. So I will share my desktop and um, open my files. Here we go. So just a few slides in the beginning. So we see the market shares 2020 acquired by 31% of independent companies. And they are of course in charge for most of the releases. So the majority of releases coming up are coming out of um, independent companies. And um, we see obviously that a certain reduction in CD. So we are down nearly to 20% and streaming is up to 60%, more than 60%. I think everyone here is aware of that. And we have the others with 5.3% where the Blu-ray is in, where I'm going to talk about. So in general, I would say music marketing in the future is talking about niches. So the mass market is somehow gone. And if we see that vinyl is a niche, CD becoming a niche, as ACD, who still knows this, it's definitely a niche. So the Blu-ray is a niche. Download, of course, again, is a niche. And streaming is a niche for most of the artists because we see obviously companies with uh, huge catalogs, they have quite a significant income out of streaming. But if we drop this down to the individual artists, there is um, very little payout for the most of them. And um, if we see about the independent uh, um, music streaming, this is the market share um, that we figured out um, talking to some of the aggregators and independent companies. So Apple Music with 16%, Amazon 13% are also into Dolby Atmos. So Spotify, we will see what they will do, but immersive audio has started to go into streaming and um, we will see how this develops and this will convert in the market share of these companies. Let me focus a bit about this, what even uh, Sven did say before. So the payout for streaming is about half a euro cent. So I think this is a quite good average we could agree on. And we checked out about 150 independent labels, about 800,000 tracks of independent music, excluding rap and hip hop. Rap and hip hop, I think, is quite popular in streaming. This works quite well on most of the platforms. But most of the other music is very much um, in a niche because even classical, jazz, rock, the streaming numbers there are quite low. And if we see that 90% of the titles available for streaming do stream less than 5,000 streams per year, which would mean an income of 15 to 25 euro, um, if you consider the half cent as a kind of income. So a production and marketing budget of 10,000 euro to create a master would mean two to four million streams. And I think um, everyone who has his independent label or an artist uh, working on his own, I think two to four million streams is not so often happening, uh, maybe apart from some major acts or big international acts. So locally, I think this is a real issue. <clears throat> So taking this into consideration, and we have a 12 euro disc sold for net 12 euro and you deduct production and some artwork stuff and mechanicals, maybe you have a revenue of nine euro. Obviously, if you're a label, if you have a distributor, you need to deduct some other stuff, but you can come up with 2000 sales to, to, to a production budget of 18,000 euro. In streaming, this would mean you need to have 3.6 million streams to come up with this budget. And with a Blu-ray, which I can again later on to that um, more in detail, you even can get up to 40,000 euro as a kind of production and marketing budget. So everyone who is familiar with Dolby Atmos, which um, is around a couple of years it came out of cinema then it came into the film uh, uh, to the film companies for home entertainment you have a lot of films with Dolby Atmos um, sound experience on that it grow more and more into the music business and we have seen a lot of major releases in the past two years like the Beatles like the Rolling Stones 
We have right now Moby from, from Deutsche Grammophon, Schiller as an electronic artist, Till Brenner, a, um, a jazz artist from Germany is releasing a record now. So all of these artists are doing immersive audio mixes, which are released then on a physical disc, on a Blu-ray. So you have a real add value, a, a very high value product to sell. Um, I believe that in the next years, this will increase very much because the streaming companies like Apple, like Amazon, like Tidal, they offer, um, like say, immersive streaming, which is a binaural stereo uh, file. It's not really Dolby Atmos or immersive, how we could experience from a Blu-ray disc, but it, of course, will spread the word. And um, as streaming will not pay more, streaming companies will not pay more per stream for an immersive file, I think to recover and to, to, to invest into um, immersive mixing, physical media is really relevant. Also important to say is that these products are very much fan driven. These are fan items. If you see on the left, the Beatles products or even the, the Rolling Stones, Gold Set Soup, these are fan editions, limited fan editions, and they have all a Blu-ray disc with immersive sound experiences. And um, so I highly consider everyone to think about not only stereo, but um, um, immersive audio as well, immersive mixing, because um, this, of course, the streaming platforms, they wanna have this and there is a way to earn some money with that doing physical media. And I love this foil because it shows how a film master is um, marketed. So when the new James Bond came out, I'm pretty sure everyone will agree that we never have seen a blockbuster film in the same when it comes to the cinema, it goes also to the public broadcasters. So the film industry have certain masters in different uh, sales channels, let's say. And before they go to subscription models, which public broadcasting is somehow, you pay a certain fee each month and then you get some kind of free TV, which is not really completely free, but I think it's a kind of subscription model. It may take some years. And I've, we probably in music business, um, have run into this day one and all formats on all platforms available. And in my philosophy, I really think a product to purchase has a certain value and our sales could be much higher if we would not release everything the same day in all formats on all platforms. So an immersive production master, if you go into the studio and you normally record in 24, six, uh, 24 um, bit and 96 kilohertz, um, you're on a high res market where you can use the files for streaming, for downloading, and obviously on physical media. So in addition to that, if you do an immersive mixing, you have a completely new channel to um, deliver this masters to, uh, to the public. So first of all, you can work in the cinema. And we started um, about five years ago, a distribution company focusing on physical distribution and cinematic distribution. So we do events in a cinema for new releases, which have a Dolby Atmos sound experience to offer um, people in a, great, in a great surrounding, really a massive, uh, a massive sound experience. Um, you can do this from the Blu-ray or you need a DCP, which is used for a cinema broadcasting normally for the film company. So you could do this for a music master as well. The second, of course, is in the physical way. So we see CD, vinyl, SACD and Blu-ray. The SACD is still around and probably Sven could confirm that there is even an increase in that for classical and jazz companies still using this format. And Blu-ray is getting more and more popular. Important to say that the figures that I saw that I showed in the beginning with the 5.8%, uh, the, the sales in Blu-ray of all these major releases that I um, told you before are all in the CD revenue. So I guess that the Blu-ray revenue is much higher than what we see from total figures because these are added to a regular CD release in the uh, market shares. And of course, number three is then a digital evaluation of the uh, 
of the master. Um, we, we all know MP3, WAF, like maybe MP, MQA. Now binaural is coming up um, as the immersive product for smartphones offered by Amazon, Tidal, and um, Apple. And the MP4 file out of this immersive mixing is offered then in streaming on Apple TV. And um, so an MP4, you have an experience on your loudspeakers, which is, let's say, a beginning of a real immersive um, Dolby Atmos experience or Auro 3D, which is a different format, also um, available on Blu-ray disc. Um, but the regular smartphone user listens to binaural uh, stereo files, which um, obviously is not the high-res uh, master that you get out of the studio. So I think creating a high-res master is normally done today for each music production. And I think that the usage of this master is very often very limited. And I would like to encourage everyone to look into this type of media and to think about different distribution and marketing ways, because um, there is no other media than physical media with a Blu-ray disc right now who can offer an experience which you never had before. So if you want to have more information, please, you can check out my website at Value Consulting. Um, and um, I do webinars, seminars, workshops about these issues. So please, um, yeah, contact me, get in touch with me. If there are any asked questions, we probably can ask here and answer in the chat as well. Thanks, Brian. Christoph, thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, yeah, we're hearing more and more about immersive audio all of the time. And uh, if it's going to benefit physical media, then it's just another benefit for us all. Um, I, we have, of course, more questions for you, but we do also have Connie Como with us as one of the panelists today. Uh, Connie, I don't want you to think that we forgot about you. So if you want to come on right now and, and say hello and tell us a little bit about the ADS group and let me know also what, what's driving your business these days. Hi, Brian. Thank you for having us. Um, the ADS Group, Optical Media Manufacturer, have been in business over 30, 30 plus years now. Um, we also have a studio. And I, I just have to say, you know, spend sort of encompassed um, what's going on. Um, uh, we're in the same, same position. We're seeing um, um, an increase in CDs. We're seeing an increase in DVD replication. Um, and it's been good. And, and based on what Sven said and Andre uh, and Christoph, I mean, things have, um, have been real positive for the physical media. Having said that, there have been some challenges. And it, and it you know, since I was since August, you know, the, you know our busy season, um, I, not only did it start earlier, but I see it extending um, into December. So um, good for the optical media industry. There is a part, you know, of the ADS group. We've always been um, considered very dependable, reliable, quick turns. Um, and there is a sense of uh, that feeling of, you know, we're doing the best we can. We're running 24-7. And, you know, that little feeling of, of disappointment, um, you know, disappointing some of the labels, disappointing some of the clients. We're used to running a, you know, a five to 14 day delivery. And when you're looking at a 30 day to 45 day delivery in optical media, I, I never thought I would ever see that. Um, I've, well, I haven't, you know, and, you know, based on some of the market research we did, what, you know, I remember being, um, where were we, when we were physically together, um, nobody predicted this, you know, nobody predicted what was going to happen and, and how could we, um, but yes, we're all, whether you're an optical medium manufacturer, whether you're a vinyl manufacturer, whatever industry you're in, the challenges that we're faced with, the onus that's being put on the companies when you're looking at lead times that are, you know, six months out, seven months out, when you're looking at packaging that you've, um, whether it's printed, you know, print board or jewel case packaging, we're having to invest more capital into inventory. 
um, than we ever had before. So, which also puts a little bit on the space issue, you know, continuing to look for space. Um, it is good. Everybody's like, yeah, hey, these are good problems to have. And it's like, yep, they are. And one of the questions that people have always asked me before on panels is what, what makes you um, stay awake at night? You know, what makes you not sleep? This, <laughs> what we're in currently, <laughs> this is making me not sleep, you know? And once again, I just go back and, and for the labels and the artists and our clients that we value, it is very difficult um, to continually be delayed on projects. So. Right. Right, right. It's very hard. Yeah, oh, I know. And, and if you look at maybe pictures of me of a couple of years ago, I definitely had a much fuller head of hair. Exactly. <laughs> but since then, it, since then, yeah, it's it's been going, it's from doing this all of the time, I think, oh, dear, what are we going to do now? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> when we first went through, when, when COVID hit that first year, we, we, we fared well through it. Our company stayed open. Um, we were considered essential because not only do we work in, you know, with some of the labels um, and, you know, do the DVD and optical media for artists, we also serve other markets, whether it's the medical industry, um, whether it's education, publishing, that industry. So we have a variety of different markets that we're focused on. So we, we, did, we did fairly well, very well. The challenge is, if, if I consider this post-pandemic, I feel like we're, it's not post-pandemic, but um, we have been faced with labor, labor shortages. We've been faced with transportation, logistics. Um, and so not, not only do you have that delay, um, as Fen said, there's not one aspect of our business in our commod, what we consider the commodities or what we need to make this product, a finished product that ha hasn't seen an increase in price. So it's like, okay, you're going to wait six months. And by the way, you know, you're going to pay more. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just, it's very, yeah, it's, it's once again, you know, I'm glad, glad that, you know, things are booming. Um, I, we've also noticed because of the delay in vinyl, they, they expect that CD to be turned fairly quickly. And in, their, in our, some of the artists and, and, and labels aren't, aren't used to waiting this long of a lead time for product. So when they went to plan for the release, they didn't allow 30, 45 days for a CD, who would ever thought. Um, so now, you'll see that initial order go through. And as Ben said, the initial order goes through and it could be one week, you know, right behind it, there's a reorder going through. So you have the reorders coming quickly and you'll also see the increase in quantity. Whereas before it could have been 5,000. I need 5,000 for my initial release. It might be 15,000, you know, and then have the reorder quickly follow, so. It's a, it's a bit of a hoarding effect, I think, maybe it because is. of what we experienced with other materials, even toilet paper, for that matter. You know, it was just now when you see something that you just can't get instantaneously or within 24 hours on Amazon anymore, uh, people feel that they need to have more rather than just kind of wait and see what happens. Um, what well, Christoph and Sven, if you would like to go ahead and turn your cameras on also, so we can kind of open this up as a, a group discussion here. Um, one of the things that I've always kind of wondered was, is that with all of the hoopla that's been going on with vinyl, um, do you think that maybe the, the CD, DVD industry, I, of course, we know it is, we'll say decline, but then at the same time, do, is, does it have a particular image problem? that we need to work on as, as a collective group. Um, like in the past, I know that the Blu-ray Disc Association, for example, they had a, a very strong marketing effort years ago about promoting uh, Blu-ray disc, Blu-ray video, better picture, better sounds. But uh, that kind of, we'll say, petered out once the format wars uh, ended. But at the same time, I think it's one of those things that maybe we need more of a push, get more of that out there, because I know that when we talk about it within our circles, it seems that we get very excited about that, but who should be now taking the torch and 
and driving the message out there that there is a very interesting business and there are opportunities here. So um, I agree with you, Brian. I think one of the biggest um, uh, pushes that, that we've had in the industry have been from the artists themselves. Um, talking about physical media and ordering physical media, and you will be seeing it in retail stores. So uh, I think that has helped our industry tremendously um, to see that. I mean, would you agree, Sven? It's, uh, I, I can add the following. I not only uh, agree, I think I can uh, put, put uh, uh, an argument here, which is uh, I haven't seen this product for 20 years, to be honest. So, so we stopped the production of CD singles um, 20 years ago, as, as the market was, was, was dead for a CD single. It's a surprise. We have, we have manufactured, at least I can remember, in the last eight weeks, three singles in Europe for, for very famous artists uh, released as a CD single. And we are not talking about 1,000 promo discs. It was in the region, let's say, 20, 40,000 plus single CDs as a tool and this is like I, I say it's a statement so this is my music is available on a cd single one track only this is it and this was not only Coldplay or a cheering more artists and, and this was great seeing that that you have a cd single in the market this is so great uh, to see this products uh, coming back and this opens a lot of new fields uh, for also experiencing what is the value of a CD single. You may say we have seen some of them being priced at retail at $4.99, mm -hmm. which is no, it's a, it's a, it's a good price. And we have seen some even priced at $6.99 Euro for a single CD with one track. And so far we, we can um, assume they are sold through because there were reorders, even on CD singles. And this was unexpected. So, so I don't see an image problem, um, Brian, to this product. I think it has a value in itself. And this is just to be explored by a lot of uh, stakeholders. It's not only the manufacturers. Uh, I think it's a good combination of the labels, of creative people, of maybe people who are not even from our industry in bringing it forward. And I would like to hand over to Christoph because Christoph is, he's really the expert in marketing the physical product. And I think Christoph, you can also confirm this, right? Absolutely. I mean, what we have seen the past years with all the streaming discussion and the, let's say, the decrease of CDs and let's say the image, there might have been an image problem for the CDs because artists were suffering also on tour sales. So young art, we, have, we see a lot of young artists which sold maybe two, three thousand, four thousand discs, uh, not in record stores, but on their um, events. Mm -hmm. So of course, Corona, no events, no sales. And even more, CD has lost a certain hipness, let's say, in, in, in a standard packaging. It works at retail, but I think at the, at the, at the uh, concerts, people went more and more to merchandise like uh, T-shirts and, and hoodies and this stuff. So and I think we are right now in a very good position with the sound formats. If we establish the new sound formats, because they are there and uh, there is now a request from a company like Apple that want to have this. So every company, every major company is obliged to deliver immersive sound experience to Apple. Mm -hmm. And um, if people would know, so how this could sound from a Blu-ray, you will, would be completely blown away. So I think it's a good perspective if we establish, let's say, the value of physical media and packaging. So that this mixture of packaging and physical media is an absolutely issue. And I think everything which is fan driven and you have something in your hand which has a value will continue to sell. So maybe for mm -hmm. a, a regular artist, a four page booklet in a jewel case with a CD, this is quite okay, maybe also on streaming. But money normally is, and that's what we see, money is not an issue for purchasing a product. So we, we sell about 400, 500 um, um, products right now, all with Blu-ray, audio, and uh, surround or immersive mixing. And no product is really below, uh, below 30 euros. And they are selling. And even the fan, the, the fan packages you saw before, like Let It Be or Abbey Road. So we are talking about products between 70 and 120 euros, and they are selling significant numbers. So there is a really turnover contribution uh, to this. And um, 
I mean, I'm trying to to work towards the music business, or to the music companies, not to put them only in the fan packages, because what I know from some retailers, the highest percentage in stolen product in their stores are Blu-rays out of a fan package. <laughs> so people are interested. They don't want to pay 100 euro, but they want to have the sound experience. This is one thing. And I think um, we start next year with an with, um, event called Visions of Sound. So we go to retail and we do immersive audio experiences because we want that people are have the, the possibility to listen to this um, incredible sound. And if we see the hardware sales right now, so the TVs are... The sound of a TV screen is not really good today. So if you have Netflix or others, they deliver um, immersive audio experience with Dolby Atmos as well. So at least you need to get a sound bar. So nearly every new sound bar is sold with the Dolby Atmos um, um, integration. So it's there. So the hardware is there. The Blu-rays are there. There is no problem. We just need to create products and encourage labels and artists to use their masters in various uh, media forms. I think, and Christoph, you, you made a good point. Um, prior to, you know, what we consider the busy season uh, starting, um, we did a lot of fan-based, a lot of deluxe packaging. And, and that's where we saw um, some of the growth, some very unique packaging. What we hadn't seen in the years past is this push for jewel case product going into retail. I haven't seen that in, in, in years in at the volume that is being produced and manufactured currently this for this season. Um, so now we have that combination. We have those deluxe packages that are available, but we also have the jewel case, the jewel case or a sleeve package that's going out and will be in the stores for this holiday season. So it's a great combination. Yeah. If you can get the jewel cases. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. I, I want to just let everybody know in the audience that if you have any questions for our panelists today, just go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, you're welcome to ask whatever you want. Um, and of course, I'll be referring over to that from time to time. Um, one thing that I did see was that uh, was from Chip Bearing, and I guess this is uh, directed to you, Christoph, is, is that uh, he's looking for a source to remaster existing audio for SACD and deliver a proper SACD master for application. And you have any maybe guidance of maybe where Chip might be looking and in which direction to find what he needs? What, what was the, what did he have? What, do, what does he have? He has. He says he needs a source and exist for an existing audio for CA, SA CD. Existing he wants audio. to get so that remastered. Any ideas? So he has. He has the recording, which has the quality, let's say, of the recording to work on an SA CD. I think that's what he's asking here. But uh, Chip, if you want to kind of maybe fill in a little bit more, we can come back to that question. Oh, he says that's what I need to know. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there are, I, I don't know, Sven, are you still offering that? I mean, there are a lot of mastering studios who still do SACD. He could contact me via the website and can give him some, um, some studios who can do this. And um, as far as I know, Sven, you still do SACDs, right? Yes, yes. So um, have the replication is, yep. is uh, there. So um, there are a couple of studios who work in the high res. Most of them do also Blu-ray authoring um, who can do an SACD master. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and is there any special recording process to make SACD, or is it pretty much? I mean, you create a DSD ma master file, so it's. Um, I'm not a technical expert in audio engineering, but I'm. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the guy who makes the recording knows what to do to 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 record it in that way. I mean, on, on the Blu-ray, for example, you have 24 bits and a maximum of 192 kilohertz. And SACD is even the double in kilohertz. So the quality is even higher on SACD than on Blu-ray. Um, so you need, you need to record, you have a certain software to have, I guess, to make this um, files, um, to prepare the files in a proper way, and then give them to a mastering studio to create the uh, production master of that. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, what I'll also do is we'll send out, of course, to everybody afterwards, um, your links. Uh, so as far as uh, how they can get in touch with you folks, and that way, if there's any other questions in that respect, so you can um, talk directly with them for sure. Um, we've got another question for you, Christoph. Are there any net worthy music labels embracing or committing to physical Dolby Atmos product in Europe? I would say everyone, all the majors are doing uh, physical media Blu-rays with the uh, Dolby Atmos right now and a lot of independence as well. So I would say it's already there and um, we have a lot of releases seen in the past two years and a real push since the summer this year as um, Apple is uh, requesting Dolby Atmos files. So someone needs to mix them and if you mix them, you will earn some money with that. And if streaming doesn't pay more than for as for a stereo file, I'd see, I think it's reasonable to release this as a physical media. And I highly consider to make fan editions. So a CD plus a Blu-ray. This is a nice value for money and you can make, make a nice double package. And I still say that 30% of the CD volume could be CD plus Blu-ray is everyone really would release this type of products because the players are there, hardware is there. And if you don't have a Blu-ray player, you're pretty sure a friend of yours has a Blu-ray player and maybe a Dolby Atmos soundbar and give it a try. Okay, yeah. Well, I know of, and uh, I can let you know is, is that uh, making vinyl, we run a package, annual, annual packaging awards. And one of the submissions this year is a vinyl, a CD, and a Blu-ray, all in one combo gatefold package. So it's quite unique. Um, and uh, I think it's going to do very well in the competition. And yeah, maybe that's really what we should be looking at is, is comboing these, we'll say, uh, different forms of physical media together. Because I remember at one point, it was a Blu-ray and a DVD which was trying to get you through that particular tradition or, or, or bridging the gap at that point of moving from D DVD to Blu-ray. So it gave that feeling that you weren't being forgot. But I also remember that being very expensive um, at that time as well. And I, I don't know if that still happens so much where you see both in the packaging. I, I mean, we see the fan editions and I mean, they have two, three CDs, a vinyl and a Blu-ray. So I mean, this is what the market is right now. We don't see major artists with only a Blu-ray release. It's more an add-on, let's say, for the high value fan packages. And, um, but what I have seen, if we, for example, Yellow, maybe some of you know the, the, the electronic uh, band Yellow from Switzerland, they do, did a Blu-ray only release. Kraftwerk, another, I mean, an electronic business in general is very popular, of course, immersive sound experiences. And they do very well with Blu-rays at retail. And um, so they pay off for the money that you need to spend for it. And I think this is the important message. You have a product which people are requesting because there is a demand in the market. There's not so much releases right now uh, available. So really everyone who has this um, home cinema setups um, are interested in, in music and they, they need content. So it's a really good time to release this type of music. Yeah. And, I, and the producer, I talked to Giles Martin, the son of uh, George Martin of the Beatle pro producers, and he is retouching all the old analog tapes and remixing all the Beatles catalog in Dolby Atmos. And I think this is the direction a lot of producers will do because they are more and more requested now to work with immersive audio uh, sound. So they need to deliver master files. And um, I think we will see a lot of reissues again with um, a Dolby Atmos uh, sound experience. And is, is uh, Sonos the only per, uh, company that's making this type of experience, experiential type physical hardware, or are there other companies that are in this space as well? Sony or Sonos? What did you say? Sonos. So you Sonos, said Sonos, okay. right. I mean, you, you have sound bars and you need certain amount of speakers. So you could connect Sonos speakers, I think, as well to an immersive audio experience uh, with a sound bar and additional speakers. And um, 
I mean, I don't want to market now, especially one brand or focus on one brand. Right. Go to the retailers, listen to the different um, experience that you get, and you figure out very fast what is a good setup for your um, home. Because, um, of course, you can have a sound bar for 500 euro and it's written Dolby Atmos on it. It doesn't give the real, let's say, Atmos experience because you need reflection uh, um, parts on the wall to get the music around you, to get this 3D ambient, right? And what I can consider always is speakers in the back. So if you have speakers in the back, and even if they are up firing, you have a really good um, a really good sound experience and it's below a thousand euro way this starts okay okay well christmas is right around the corner maybe i should be checking into this right now what, what do we feel as far as let's say capacity for the future you know one of the things that happened in vinyl was is that everybody thought that the format was on its last leg machines were being disposed of machines were being stripped for spare parts and then all of a sudden there wasn't anybody manufacturing machines for vinyl anymore. It was only up until about a couple of years ago that we started to see new entries coming back into the market again. Um, we're not really seeing that number of companies that are still making new machines for CD and DVD. Do we feel that we're going to have any issues as far as capacity moving forward if we start to see even a bigger pop in the business? Um, Sven, how, how are, what's your capacity right now? What's, what's your, your turnaround um, times? Is that within something that you foresee as being a problem? So turnaround times in the peak season is always a tricky question, right? And, and uh, looking at the audience of all the participants in this great uh, panel, so, so uh, this is all of the, I think we have now more than 70 or so people uh, being here. So, so I would say, Turnaround times always tricky, and, and we are not as bad as in vinyl production. This is the good news. Uh, I saw one of the chat questions was like, is it now eight months, nine months, or even longer than vinyl? So CD is uh, far better uh, still. I don't see a capacity issue uh, in the next foreseeable years because we're coming for the industry from a much higher level. So even that Singulus is not manufacturing any new lines in CD, I don't see this as a task for, for the foreseeable future, as we're coming from huge capacities. If you look at the optical disc market as such, all across the optical media, was like 15 years ago in the region of 18 billion disc pre-recorded per year. Um, this was not all CD, but this tells a number what was around. And if we still look around what kind of equipment is still in the market, it's still huge. and. Um, even though we see for the first six months, if I remember right, the US numbers on CD was like, and Connie was mentioning this, uh, CD is up, yes. Against previous year, we see like 44% up in the US CD market against previous year. So first six months of 21 in comparison to 20, yes. But if we compare this to 2019, the pre-pandemic year, it was down 19%. So this gives, I think, uh, the right uh, stage that the CD volumes are still on the global level. It's not as big, but it's still a decline number, to be honest. On, on this. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe it slows down and uh, with this positive fall this year, maybe next year we see like this is below 10% decline rate again, which would be great. And if this levels out like that uh, CD volume, CD audio levels in particular, uh, only down like uh, five to eight percent per year. This would be fantastic news. I don't see that the bottom is uh, being reached already. So, so we expect there is a further decline. Everything else would be not the right message, I think, to all of us in the industry. But yes, you're right, Brian. We should be prepared that once the bottom is reached, it may be a similar story like like vinyl. That then is a constant volume. But having said this, is there enough machines around? that uh, we have these machines in place. We have to keep them good maintained, that uh, the spare parts are available. And the bigger issue, what we have seen, is not the question so much, are there enough replication lines around? Uh, it's about people. So what we have seen is that, especially this industry of optical media replication, 
and this is maybe true also for a lot of other industries, we are missing skilled people. And this is all across. We could have wished alone at Sonopress here in Germany, we could have wished to employ another 50 heads in production uh, in September alone, October, but we couldn't get hold of them. It's so difficult to find people with skills, willingness, and uh, the approach to work in industry. It's not only particular optical disc industry, it's about where are um, the people um, that, that we need. And we have seen this, this is in a lot of other markets, it's very difficult. Um, maybe this is due to the pandemic effects, but we see this, this is the biggest bottleneck to get the right people uh, for this industry. And uh, maybe this is a signal. It's not so much about machines availability and uh, capacities, it's to have the right people. And if you look to ourselves, to the audience, to a lot of uh, people in this industry, our average age is not necessarily reflecting um, a mid-30 age. So, so it's probably a bit higher. And so um, we see a lot of very experienced experts from this industry leaving now or within the next five years. And uh, what, what we need is the next generation to join this industry right. to it, keep it alive. And this is what we are missing. It's about I people. Concur. And I concur with Sven. I don't think the, the replication machine capacity will be an issue. Um, no. there, there's plenty of um, you know, machines out there. I, I do think spare parts is an issue. I think that not just with the replication aspect, but your finishing equipment, whether it's your packaging lines, um, we, we always try to have a backup on the shelf. Sometimes something happens where it's unforeseen um, and you're waiting longer for parts to arrive. So I don't, I don't think you'll see that with the equipment. I also concur with, with the people. Um, it is about people and having skilled people, especially when it comes to you know, DVD and, and mastering. Um, we have seen an increase in our need for tech coverage, um, technicians. Um, so we're experiencing the same thing. Yep. Okay. okay. Well, we're, we're coming. Uh, I do want to address though, Brian, I, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed to talk about our lead time. Uh, one of the things that Patrick asked, he said 30 to 45 days for CD turnaround time. Yes. Currently our lead time is between 30 to 45 days. What we're doing is we're trying to work with our clients, the labels, artists, to say, you know, if we can get, you know, a partial in or something in to help a, a street date, um, you know, to help fulfill a certain need. But when planning, please allow, especially right now, at least yeah, 30, 30 to 45 days. Mm -hmm. So especially for some of your larger projects. <clears throat> mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that 30 to 45 days in the context of everything else that's been delayed in every aspect of manufacturing, that doesn't seem to be too bad anymore. Oh, people um, aren't used to it, though. People are not used to the CD and DVD waiting that long. Oh, yeah, for sure, because it, it goes back to what we were talking about before. There used to be so much capacity out there right. that it was never an issue. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to hear, though, that there are, we'll say, this constant stream of uh, influx of work that's coming in. It may help also with your planning as well. Uh, so we don't have these. we got to get it this moment. You know, instead, we can figure out what we need as far as what, on the raw material side and all of the planning that goes into that as well. Um, maybe we can just kind of come to the end and wrap it up with a little bit of a final thought as where we think we'll be five years from now. And uh, maybe we can start with you, Connie. Retired? No. <laughs> <laughs> come no. on. <laughs> <laughs> um, five years from now. Um, well, the, the exciting news with our company is we continue to grow. So we have added printing lines. We will continue to do optical media. Um, we have increased our studio services and we have made the decision to bring in vinyl manufacturing. So we will be a manufacturer of vinyl. Um, we have put it off for a very long time, um, but our clients have um, sort of uh, pushed us in that area. We are... I'm not taking any purchase orders right now. 
Um, we do we do outsource currently our vinyl. We're going to continue to do so. We are a long way off uh, from having process and having that set up and going. So, but that's an exciting thing for us. We continue to focus on um, custom packaging, um, and that's where we will be. Awesome. Yeah, that's thanks for the announcement. I, you heard it here first, huh? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> congratulations on that. That's that's awesome news. And, and Sven, where, where do you think we're going to be? Uh, let me start with uh, looking back five years. So, so uh, when, when we look back to five years in 2016, mm. and what have we done in 2016? If we look at the volumes, it was the same volumes that we do now. So, so global volumes that, that we are contributing with our sites in uh, Germany and Hong Kong, because you may know that we have withdrawn from Mexico and reorganizing these volumes into the German side. So it's, it's in the same region that uh, including Asia, both together, it's the 200 million disc level from, from um, if you ballpark number, which is Germany in the region of 100, whatever, 180 million uh, plus minus, something like this, which is, which is, I think, fair in the comparison five years ago. And keeping fingers crossed that we're in the same region in five years from today, but then also looking more because volume definition is only one part and one aspect of the whole thing. It's not about volumes only, it's about services, scope, having the eye on the customers uh, to, to fulfill their needs and requirements. And if we compare this five years ago, in the beginning of 2016, there hasn't been any UHD, no mastering in UHD, no machine for UHD. And this is a new, Kid on the block, it was a new optical media, and we've done millions since then, tens of millions of UHD discs, which is a fantastic story. Uh, the success of vinyl, Connie just mentioned, uh, who could now uh, take um, vinyl out of the scope for the next years from printing services, packout services, and others? What is happening in merchandising fields? Uh, so I would say it's not only about the disc, it's about all the surrounding services from merch, D2C business, e-commerce services, keeping the value chain alive for physical media. And this is a lot to do in the next five years or so. And I would like in five years, look back to 2021 and have a similar conclusion, like from today, looking five years back, what happened uh, since 2016. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. That's very optimistic. Thank you very much, Sven. And Christoph, of course, if you want to wrap it up. And I hope that in five years we have reached out to millions of people to give them an immersive audio experience to have the chance to listen to that. And if we're able to do this, I'm pretty convinced that immersive audio will be a complete set standard for recording and then also for replication on physical media. Very good, very good. Well, we're, we are, as being media tech and making vinyl, we're still planning at some point next year to do an in-person event. So maybe we can talk about more about how things are continuing to go at that point. Uh, stay tuned, check out our website, see what's going on um, when we do pull the trigger on that. Hopefully that's going to be very soon. Things seem to be loosening up. Um, around the world. It, the Europeans are now allowed to come into the United States. So it looks like things might be a lot easier to, to navigate. Um, with that being said, we do have another presentation, which is a pre-recorded presentation, which I hope you guys will all stick around for. It's uh, vinyl postcards. Um, but before we launch that, I want to just thank you very much for your time today. I think it was been an excellent discussion. Um, I'd like to have more discussions with you. So we'll, we'll keep in touch and we'll put this video up um, as soon as it's ready. It usually takes us about a week or so. Uh, and then we'll put it up on the media-tech.org website. Um, and one other thing that I forgot to mention, that one piece of packaging that I was talking about before, which has the vinyl, the, the CD and the DVD is the Gayfold Plus, that's something that Chip Varing could let you know more about. But uh, at this point, we're gonna, I'm gonna stop it here and then I'm gonna ask Andre to go ahead and start the presentation for the postcards. Thank you again, guys. And Thank thanks you. for our audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Vinyl Postcards office.
My name is Kenneth and I have the pleasure to introduce you to our company, Vinyl Postcards Timeless Media. Before I start, I would like to thank Brian and the Making Vinyl organization for giving us this opportunity to introduce ourselves. For the next couple of minutes, I will show you what vinyl postcards actually are, tell you a little of how it all started, what we have achieved so far, and what we are planning for the future. So let's begin with where it all started. Inspired by the great idea of the vintage record postcards from the 50s and 60s, we completely rethink this format and take it from a disposable item to a valuable and sustainable postcard record that is not only accessible in the analog, but also in the digital domain. To create a format that incorporates various approaches of accessibility while staying simple and compact was the goal we wanted to achieve. And so we did. The vinyl postcard is born. But what are vinyl postcards? In short, vinyl postcards are records in postcard format, accessible analog via a manual record player and digitally via a native app and the browser-based web app. The cards hold up to 3 minutes 30 of audio on the front side, a cardboard layer on the back side and have the exact size of postcard format which is 148 by 105 millimeters weighing exactly 18 grams which qualifies them to be sent off for cheap postcard fares. Their grooves can be played on every manual record player and they deliver a good sound quality that might surprise you. They also last as long as a conventional LP pressing. To be able to access their digital features, you have to either install the native app on Android or launch a browser window and visit my.vinylpostcards.com. To give you a better idea, let me show you a little section of the quick start guide to our native app. We designed the app as a digital playback device for our vinyl postcards. To open and play back a vinyl postcard, Tap on the icon on the bottom right. You have now entered the scan mode. As soon as the app recognizes the vinyl postcard, a record player appears in augmented reality and the vinyl postcard begins to spin. As you can see, the record player appears to be three-dimensional, with lots and lots of detail. If you close the AR environment, you will find yourself in the music player section. From this screen, you can enter the more content section which shows you more information about the vinyl postcard you are currently playing. You can choose between the two different record player models. By tapping the virtual player button you will enter the AR environment again. To place the virtual record player in your room, move your camera around. As soon as the app detects the dimensions of your surroundings, a skeleton of the record player appears. Tap the screen to place it and the playback will start. You can also skip through all the vinyl postcards you've already scanned, which are organized in the app's library. Which brings us, last but not least, to the library section. After you have scanned the vinyl postcard, it will be saved to the library permanently and you will be able to play it and its additional content at any time. Our augmented reality app is a true thing of wonder and for those of you who have been wondering how the recognition process is solved, we use an image target technology that allows us to simply recognize the card by that graphic surface. This way, the scan process feels very natural and is always rewarded with a great AR experience. But let me also introduce you to our just recently launched web app and its basic functionality. As you have seen, other than the native app, the web app needs a code to access your digital vinyl postcard. 
This unique code is printed on every individual card, allowing it to be opened without the need of another app, and it is accessible on every device with a browser and internet access. In general, we currently offer to add up to five more tracks to your digital vinyl postcard, as well as additional infos, pictures, links, and even videos. This service is included and works on both the web app and the native app. Now that you know all the key facts to our format, let me give you a couple of insights about our production process. The production is in some aspects similar to conventional vinyl pressing, but the devil, as always, is in the detail. We too start with doing a master cut of the audio delivered by the customer. We too demand a dedicated vinyl master for that, since our cutting process follows the principle of a lacquer cutting machine and all that physical restrictions that come with it. Of course, we adapted the whole process in regards of the extreme radius as well as the reduced amount of space. The result is a specialized vinyl cutting machine that is optimized only for the purpose of cutting masters at this radius. The next step in the production chain is of course a galvanizing process. This is also similar to the one used for a conventional LP stamper, which brings us to the final step, the injection molding process. In this process, we press the record layer and marry the print layer with it at the same time, resulting in this. All this is possible through a very specific combination of materials that are being used for the record layer, the print work layer, as well as the right process parameters, of course. The whole development kept us busy for the last two years and was laced with setbacks and challenges we initially did not think we will be facing. But through research and extensive trial runs, we found a solution and in January this year, we were finally able to introduce the vinyl postcard into the market. In the last couple of months, we have successfully processed around 25 production runs for clients, mostly for record labels and indie artists, but also for companies, art fairs, contemporary artists, advertising agencies, and even poets. Most of them were sold immediately between 10 and 15 euros, and some have arrived in Discogs, where sellers are asking for more than 30 euros each. We also collected over 900 contacts through advertising and lead generation, and have sent out a sample to all of them. The feedback we received was very positive, if not exuberant. So that is where we are now. Soon, we will put our second manufacturing tool in operation, allowing us to produce a capacity of 50,000 units a month. Further, we have planned to optimize the production process in regards of automation, and as soon as demand rises, we are able to react quickly and add additional production capacities. We also start the development of a B6 vinyl postcards format. The additional space extends the playing time up to five minutes. Further, we are already working on mutations of the existing format and try to offer clear cards as well as double-sided clear and colored cards by the end of the next year. Regarding our digital vinyl postcards platform, we have big plans. To give the customer full control to the content he wants to integrate within his vinyl postcard, we will develop a content management system that gives the client the possibility to administrate his content dynamically and in real time. This way, the vinyl postcard can also be used as some sort of subscription token. You buy the card once and have access to the releases of an artist for a certain amount of time. Or you can use it as a tour-only release and integrate live versions or best-of videos of the tour into the card once the tour is over. But the biggest vision we are pursuing with our digital vinyl postcard is to bring the band itself as an augmented reality experience straight into the living room. As you can see in our native app, there is a lot of potential for immersive augmented reality experiences and bring the band even closer to the fan through such technology will create a whole new level of music experience. We are convinced that the vinyl postcard can make a serious contribution to the music industry, but more important, to the music culture itself. It doesn't matter whether you want to release your next single or even EP, an exclusive fan-only song, or simply want to put it on your merch table. The vinyl postcard marries the analog with the digital domain and creates a whole new platform. It further allows you to seriously monetize your digital content connected to it while maintaining the valuable feel of a physical, sustainable format. With our short turnaround times of 
four to five weeks only, you're also able to really work with it within your release schedule. So if you have any further questions, want to have a sample, or would like to discuss some aspects, I am happy to answer all your questions and inquiries. Please contact me via Kenneth at vinylpostcards.com. Thanks for your time and attention. We are looking forward to make business together. I hope everybody enjoyed that. And uh, some good news also with that is, is that Colonial Purchasing and Making Vinyl will be working with them directly here in North America as their representative. So if you have any questions also, you can always reach out to me. But uh, I'll make sure that everybody gets, we'll say a link to this video as well as uh, more information on how you can contact Kenneth if you didn't catch it in the recorded presentation. Um, at this point, I really would like to thank everybody again. Um, please check back with makingvinyl.com and also media-tech.org for our upcoming presentations. And we would really like to uh, wish you uh, uh, a good day. And if we don't see you before the Thanksgiving period, uh, of course, a very nice Thanksgiving time as well. So at this point, I'll leave you, but please stay in touch and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Bye for now.